All right, finally did it. I finally got through the book that many of us have known about for years, but very few people seem to have actual re actually read. It's uh, Battlefield Earth, written by L. Ron Hubbard, who is most famous for founding the Church of Scientology. And, uh, well, I'll be honest, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, if you're like me, you probably only knew about this book originally because of the movie. And if you're unfamiliar with the movie, it's, it's horrendous. Here's a couple of clips from it to give you an idea of what it's like. While you were still learning how to spell your name, I was being trained to conquer galaxy. We've decided to keep you here for another 50 cycles. With endless options for renew, with endless options for renew, with endless options for renew. <laughs> Has anyone here ever seen one? A demon? Uh, a monster? A beast? Yeah. Basically, every YouTube channel that talks about bad movies at, at all has a video on Battlefield Earth somewhere in their catalog. And in fact, this copy that I have of the book proudly says on the front, soon to be a major motion picture starring John Travolta, Barry Pepper, and Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. <laughs> well, I won't lie to you, the book is better than the movie, because the movie actually only covers the first half of the book, so you can see there's actually a lot more tabs in the first half than in the second half. And that might give off the impression that the second half is better. It's really not. It's equally bad, and actually I would say it's worse, but it's bad in more of a boring way. You know, whereas the first half, there is like an actual story there, and there are some bits that I genuinely think are good. Uh, but overall, it's just, it does, it does not work very well. See, the first half is kind of just cheesy, old-school sci-fi, like manly man does manly things and saves the day, you know, that sort of thing. The second half, I, I'll admit, I wasn't expecting so much talk about intergalactic banking and finance to come in in this over a thousand page long book. And before I really get going, I do want to point out that L. Ron Hubbard is probably the biggest piece of shit whose work I've talked about on here. Like, before now, it was probably Ben Shapiro, but Ben Shapiro, while he is an asshole, just Hubbard's on a whole nother level. Like, the dude founded a cult, uh, he blackmailed people, kidnapped them, committed all sorts of fraud, uh, indoctrinated them into his cult, tax evasion, like, this guy did a lot of nasty shit over the course of his life, and I'm glad he's dead. So, when I say that the book is somewhat better than the movie, and when I give it credit for the couple of things it does well, keep in mind, I'm not doing that because I like Hubbard or I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. I think he was an absolute monster and I'm glad he's dead. But what's the actual story of this book? Well, the full title is Battlefield Earth, A Saga of the Year 3000, and basically what it is is in the year 2000, which this was written in the 80s, so uh, this would have been like 20 years later, uh, the, an alien race known as the Cyclos came to Earth, killed most of the humans, and took over so that they could just mine all of the metals and such that we have here. And so now, a thousand years later, humanity is reduced to these primitive little bands that are wandering around in the countryside and avoiding the Cyclos at all costs because anytime they run into them, they're just immediately dead. And then enter a character named Johnny who just decides, hey, you know what, I'm going to bring the humans together, and I'm going to lead a rebellion and throw the Cyclos off the planet. Okay, that sounds kind of cheesy and a little dumb, but hey, that could possibly be fun. You know, maybe not super serious or anything, but it could be fun. Let's, uh, let's see where it goes. So the very first line on the very first page is actually a line from the main villain of the story. Man, said Turl, is an endangered species. Now, I know it might sound strange to stop that quick, but the instant I read that when I first got through this, I thought, okay, that's pretty good. See, the villain knows about humans, and he feels like he's so far above us that he can look down at us almost like animals, and he's just like, yes, there's only a couple thousand of them left, they're below us, we can kill them anytime we want, they're almost gone, whatever, it's not a big deal. And so I thought, okay, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Um, but over the course of this conversation, Turl is talking to his boss about humans, and he's saying, 
hey, you know, maybe we could get a couple of those humans and get them to mine for us, you know, because there's some areas which are dangerous for Cyclos to go to, and they could mine stuff like gold for us. Uh, in fact, he specifically mentions a vein of gold somewhere in the nearby mountains, which they can't go to for reasons that they'll bring up later, and he says, hey, the humans could do it for us, and his boss is just kind of annoyed with him and says, like, okay, dude, humans are just animals. They aren't going to be able to do any of that. And immediately, I s okay, I know it's been a thousand years since human civilization was mostly wiped out, but they mentioned multiple times you can still go around the, the planet and see ruins of our cities and stuff. Like, they know we were a, an intelligent civilization. They know we are at least sentient. They, they should understand this. Even, like, there, there's no level of ignorance or arrogance that would excuse that level of stupidity. There, there just isn't. And so that's a problem we're going to see throughout the entire book, is that the villains are just complete dumbasses. There's also a note at the bottom of the page which says it's from a translator, and it says that time, distance, and weight have all been translated to Earth systems to prevent confusion. And I think that's fine. I think having a little asterisk with that there uh, to help the audience get a little more into the world is okay. That's a stylistic choice, certainly, that most books wouldn't make, but not a big deal. Uh, the problem is that they only do that three times in the entire book. Uh, this is one of them. And then the last two come like 30 pages near the end. So I had basically forgotten that that was a thing and I didn't have time to get used to it. And so it took me out a little bit the first time, but then the second and third times it, I was like, oh, right, this is, this is a book, this isn't real. So it just take, takes me out of the moment. Oh Lord, we're only on the first page. And then we also have lines like this one. Char glowered at him. What in the name of diseased crap are you reading? And, uh, I'm not going to read all of them, because there are a lot, but there are a lot of really dumb bits of dialogue spread throughout this entire book, which are, well, they're like that. You know, it's the villains, uh, particularly the Cyclos, just talk weird, and it comes across as a little more silly than intimidating or threatening or anything of that nature. It just, I don't know, it, it's kind of dumb, and again, it kept taking me out. Though I will say, for the most part, the uh, actual writing of this is competent. You know, nothing special, but I believe that Hubbard was a professional author. Because because he was, before he founded the Church of, Church of Scientology. Like, I believe, okay, yeah, this guy knew more or less what he was doing. Okay, so despite all that complaining that I just did, this really is an okay opener. You know, it gives a setup for the world. Like, we understand, okay, the Earth is pretty much destroyed, there's very few humans left. Uh, and the villains are these aliens named Cyclos, who rule over us, and... <sighs> okay, the name's Cyclo. It's one letter off from Psycho. Get it? Because they're evil. You may as well just call them the bad nasties, or the evil dudes. Like, just... Okay, 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 okay. And, um... Yeah, okay. So after we learn about Turl's plan to, you know, enslave humans and make them mine for him, uh, we cut to the protagonist of the story, a guy named Johnny Goodboy Tyler. That's his real name. It's, it's, it's not Johnny and then, like, in quotes, good boy, like it's a nickname or something. Like, his full name is Johnny Goodboy Tyler, so... Yep, that's the level of subtlety we're working with here. <laughs> but anyways, it starts off with... Johnny uh, returning from a hunt to his village, which only has like 30 people left in it now. It's way up in the mountains uh, because they're hiding from the demons, as they believe the Cyclos are. And he finds out his father has just recently died, and they're burying him. And I guess it's supposed to be sad, but I mean, we don't know any of these characters, so like, how are we supposed to feel much of anything? You know, like... I mean, okay, you can say this is really more of an inciting incident because after this, Johnny says, okay, the village, we can't stay here anymore, so we're just going to go off somewhere else. But nonetheless, if we had had even a single line from his father, uh, even in flashback form, then that would help us care a little bit more. And the way Hubbard describes Johnny's appearance is uh, interesting. Johnny Goodboy had stood very tall and looked at her, 
Among people who were average height, Johnny Goodboy stood half a head taller, a muscular six feet shining with the bronzed health of his twenty years. He had just stood there, wind tangling his corn yellow hair and beard, looking at her with his ice blue eyes. Um... D does Hubbard want to fuck Johnny? So over the course of like ten pages, we get a brief introduction of this village who, like I said, its population has been shrinking, the people are getting sick, it's harder and harder to find food, uh, but they're staying there because while they're there, they're safe from the demons, which they, again, believe the Cyclos are, and Johnny just says, we can't stay here forever, I'm going to go off and find a new uh, home for us. And while, he, or right before he leaves, he says goodbye to his girlfriend named Chrissy, and she's pretty much the only named woman in this entire book. Like, you can literally count on your fingers the female characters that are in this that actually get a name. Uh, in fact, I think there's Chrissy and Patty are the only two. I don't know if Patty gets any lines, and Chrissy gets maybe three or four pages actually devoted to her in this. It's, it, it's ludicrous. Like, it is a total sausage fest in here. And I know that, yes, this was the 80s, and it's old-school sci-fi, so you should expect that. But nonetheless, it is pretty, uh, pretty glaring nowadays. So Chrissy and Johnny say goodbye. They love each other. Why? I don't know, just, just because they do. Like, Chrissy has no personality. You know, despite being the only named female character and the only one that gets even a little bit of screen time, there's nothing about her that I that makes her a character at all. Is she nice? Is she kind of a jerk? What sort of things does she like and dislike? Uh, how determined is she? We, we don't know. The only personality trait she has is she loves Johnny, and we don't know why she loves Johnny. Because Johnny, while he is not a very well-defined character, he at least is a character who actually goes out and does stuff. So then we go back to Turl, and I'm sorry if it's a little confusing to have me jumping back and forth here, but that's kind of just how the book is structured, where like a lot of the major events will be happening at the same time, and we'll just be going back and forth between different characters. I'm going to do my best to keep it in chronological order, but some parts that's just impossible, so I apologize in advance. So we go back to Turl, and we find that he is actually the head of security on Earth, because, uh, they're, they have uh, several different outposts of the, quote, Intergalactic Mining Company, which is just run by the Cyclos, and, well, as I said earlier, they mine all the ore from Earth that they can get, and Turl is chief of security, so he's in charge of fending off, like, pirate raids, he's in charge of making sure that the laws are followed there, all that sort of thing. Uh, but Earth is, like, so far out in the middle of nowhere that there's nothing nearby, and his position is kind of uh, pointless, you know? He doesn't have to worry about the native population because the human tribes are just so technologically backwards that they can't do anything. Like, Johnny's tribe in the mountains is still using stone and wooden tools. Like, they don't even have metal. Not long after this, Johnny finds some broken glass and uses it to cut, and he realizes, whoa, this is so sharp, I've never seen this before. Like, that's how primitive they are. And Turl hates being there, he just thinks, oh, this is a waste of my talents, and he just wants money, and he wants people to notice him, basically. That, that's, the, that's the main thing. Like, he wants to be rich, but he also wants people to look at him and think, wow, Turl, you're so cool. And we got basically that during his introduction, and that's it. Like, we never really learn much anything else about his motivations or what sort of person he was at all. It's just, he wants money, he wants power. Or not even power, he wants money, he wants fame, really. And I'm not saying those are bad motivations for a villain to have, it's just that you need to, if you're just going to give it to us right away in his narration, then there has to be something else, or we have to build up to it, or something. We need to do something to change it up a little. So Turl goes to another Cyclo, whose name is Zit, Zit? Z Z T. That's how it's spelled. Like, fucking hell, dude. Use a vowel. But yeah, the, he's in charge of like all the machinery and vehicles and everything. Um, and so, basically, he Turl goes to him. He says, "Hey, I want a truck so that I can go out and find some humans." And he tells Zit about the humans uh, 
how they are, you know, intelligent and everything, and Zitz is surprised. He's like, what? I thought they were basically just animals. And like, again, the ruins of civilization are all around us. We were definitely technologically inferior to you guys, because you have a whole space empire, but, like, they're around. You know, they're, they're not animals. Jesus Christ. Turl eventually gets him to agree by saying, hey, maybe some pirates will be out here. And Zit doesn't really believe him, but he's like, okay, fine. And then we just get a bunch of Turl's inner thoughts where he's thinking about, you know, again, I want fame. A break in the dull life of a security chief on a planet without insecurities. A planet that wasn't likely to produce many opportunities for an ambitious security chief to get promotion and advancement. That, that's it. That's his whole character right there. That's all you need to know. So we also cut to Johnny, who has gone on his whole journey. You know, he comes out of the mountains and he actually finds uh, ruins of an old city, which we don't get that much detail for, but he finds like an old library, which was actually sealed up. Uh, we find out later by some aliens after they came. It wasn't the Cyclos, it was another race that the Cyclos brought with them called the Chinkos, which, okay, that's one letter off from being extremely racist. And also, it's a very fine line between making names sound foreign and unfamiliar and just making them sound fucking silly. And Hubbard goes over the line into silly more often than not. But, you know, anyways, Johnny finds a library with some books and he can't read, but he can look at pictures and stuff. And he's like, wow, this is incredible. Um, and he finds a big highway as well and walks down. And he's like, wow, old humans lived in these gigantic villages, uh, there must have been so many of them, this is really impressive. The demons really must be powerful if they could do this. And at one point he kills a boar with his bare hands because <clears throat> he's just that cool. And actually I put in my notes here that he worries about Chrissy, and I put that he Chrissy is only a motivation and not a character in her own right, which, yeah, pre pretty pretty much, yeah, that's, that's a good way of... Uh, a good way of putting it. And while we're with Turl, we learn that uh, the city that Johnny is exploring, which is nearby the Cyclo Mine site, is actually the city of Denver. And I was actually a little excited when I read that, because apparently in the movie it is brought up that uh, the Cyclo Mine site is near Denver. I just never picked up on it while watching for some reason. But I was kind of excited because a large chunk of the story from this point forward does take place in Colorado. And that's where I live. And it's, you know, I don't see that very often, so it's just nice to say, hey, yes, the my home state is being represented. But here's the thing. When someone is writing about a real-world place, you can kind of tell when they've actually been there and they actually have a feel for what it's like and they write about different locations and such. You can tell, like, okay, yeah, they, they have an idea for what this place is like, what the people are like. And you can tell when they just looked up a list of landmarks and started throwing them in there and check as if they're checking off boxes. Hubbard is definitely, definitely in the second category. Like, the identity of Colorado here is completely stripped away. It's just a series of buzzwords. Like, this could take place pretty much anywhere on Earth and it wouldn't change much about the story. Like, so far we know about Johnny's tribe lives up in the Rocky Mountains. What do we know about them? They are mountains. That's it. Uh, he explored the ruins of Denver. What do we know about the ruins of Denver? It's a ruined city. We, we don't get much description of what it looks like or anything. And briefly, the Cyclos mention how it was less developed than some other cities throughout the world, but that's about it. And I mean, that's true. Denver is a young city by, uh, <laughs> by a lot of standards, but still, that's not giving us much, and it also goes over some other landmarks in Colorado, like later we'll come across the Air Force Academy, and NORAD, and some other stuff like that, and there's just, there's no identity to any of it. So, e even if I wasn't from Colorado, I don't think this would have, uh, or if I wasn't from Colorado, I don't think this would have disappointed me the way it did, but it also just doesn't draw me in. You know, the setting has no identity, it has no flavor, it has nothing there. It could take place just in a generic city anywhere on Earth, and it would be pretty much the same. It's also around this time that we learn that uranium blows up the cyclo atmosphere, because cyclos don't, can't breathe uh, Earth's atmosphere, so when they go outside of their domes, they have to have these uh, masks on. And their atmosphere they just call breathe gas, which is, again, kind of a dumb name, but 
not the worst problem in the world. We'll, we'll just move past it. Uh, the issue is that uranium, or more specifically radiation, whenever it hits their, uh, their breathe gas, it explodes. Like, and not small explosions either, big ones. So uh, the reason that they haven't mined the gold over in the Rocky Mountains is because there's also uranium over there, and they know that as soon as they breathed on it, it would go boom and kill a bunch of people. Okay, okay, here's the thing. As I said, we, we later realized that it's not just uranium, it's radiation at all that causes their stuff to explode. I'm not a physicist or a chemist or anything like that, but that does not make any fucking sense. Because, guess what? There's radiation in space all over the place. Solar radiation, that's a thing. And it comes in and it can make it blow up. And before you come in mentioning that, hey, solar radiation is different from uh, uranium radiation, uh, yes, I am aware that that's a different thing, but later on in the book they explicitly mention that solar radiation also makes it blow up. And, okay, even if your planet has an extremely powerful magnetosphere that would keep most of it out, it's not going to keep all of it out. Like, a couple of bits would come in now and again, and uh, apparently would just blow up the entire fucking planet. This is... This makes no sense, and from the moment it happened, I immediately knew, okay, that's foreshadowing, that's how they're going to defeat the bad guys somehow, or it's, they're going to use it at some point. Because you can't put in a piece of world building that is, one, that specific, and two, that stupid, and expect the readers to not go, oh, yeah, I know where they're going with this immediately. So, I already immediately could knew the basics of uh, the hero's plans throughout not just the first half, but the second half of the book. Alright, so around this time, Turl and Johnny run into each other, and Johnny's like, holy shit, it's a demon, and Turl's like, oh sweet, a human, and he manages to capture him, and he brings him back to the Cyclo base, where he uh, chains him up in a cage, and Johnny actually manages to escape a couple of times, but Turl catches him each time and throws him back in, and why Johnny didn't just wait until nighttime to run off at one point when he knows he's being watched, I don't know, but that's, uh, that, that is what he did, and... Turl is looking through some of the records to try and find out what humans eat, because, you know, he, he wants to keep Johnny around for a while. He's gonna need to know what he eats. And th they, they don't have any records of it, so he's like, well, shit, huh, how am I gonna figure this out? And while he's planning, he leaves Johnny in the cage without food or water for, like, two or three days. The time is not made super clear. At first I thought it was just a couple of hours, but then it's mentioning that Johnny is feeling his strength fading, and so I'm thinking, okay, it must be at least a day or two? I I don't know, but anyways, uh, he can't figure it out, and for some reason he doesn't want to talk to Johnny, even though they have, like, uh, translators and such. They have, you know, books that are full of English words, so he could just say, what do you want to eat? And even if he's supposed to be this arrogant guy who doesn't want to reduce himself to speaking like backwards savages, his whole plan depends on finding a human and keeping him alive for a while and teaching him about Cyclo ways so that he can get him to work for him. Like, you would... You would think he'd be able to just spend, like, ten seconds going, okay, what do you want to eat? But no, instead of doing that, he, again, lets Johnny escape, and Johnny runs off, and, like I said, he hasn't had food for several days, or water, so he jumps into a stream and just drinks a whole bunch of water... And then he sees a couple of rats going around an abandoned shack, so he manages to grab one of them and starts eating it. And then Turl pops out, captures him again, and brings him back to the cage, and he just thinks, Rats! That's it! I'll, I'll feed the humans rats! Yes, that's what they like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're too much! It's also worth noting at this point that even without technology, Turl can easily overpower Johnny because Cyclos are huge. Uh, most of them are between 8 and 9 feet tall, and they weigh around 1,000 pounds. It, that's explicitly stated in here. Like, later on we'll meet a cyclo named Kerr who's 7 feet tall, and he's thought of as almost being a midget among cyclos. That's... yeah, they're, they're really big. So, basically, in every way, humans are the underdog here. So, while they're trying to build up tension, yeah, yeah, that, that works, but... Um, uh, it does feel a little bullshitty when they finally come back. And you'll see what I mean later, but when they finally come back, it feels almost like the villains are no longer as strong as they used to be. 
So after Turl gives Johnny some water and a bunch of raw rats for him to eat, which is ugh, unpleasant to think about, but I think that's by design, uh, but he also gives him this uh, machine and kind of shows Johnny how to work it out, and which is, it takes a little bit of time, but once he does, he realizes, oh, okay, this is a teaching machine, and when he pulls a lever, it, it shoots this, like, laser beam at his head, which instantly imparts him with knowledge. Like, it instantly imparts him with knowledge of the cyclo language, it imparts him with uh, knowledge of human history, of uh, mathematics, how to read and write, all sorts of stuff like that. He just instantly learns. Now, even if we set aside how, like, this is just giving the hero stuff uh, without having them work for it, and that's pretty unsatisfying, the fact that the villain would teach him anything except the absolute bare minimum of what he needed to know to be a slave is, um, stupid. It, it's, it's stupid. Because they wind up using uh, some cyclo machinery and stuff to mine the gold, yes, but you could mine most of it with old-style, like, pickaxes and stuff like that, and also that stuff would be a lot less useful if they ever tried to fight back or flee or anything. It takes a lot less time to learn how to use, like, dude, why would you teach them all this? Like, this is the villain just giving them the rope with which they're going to use to hang him. It's the stupidest thing ever. Uh, but, anyways, while Johnny learns about all this, he realizes, wow, the world is so much bigger than I initially thought. Humanity used to be this grand civilization, and now the cyclos are gone. And so he decides he doesn't just want to find a new home for his village anymore so that they can be safe. He wants revenge on the cyclos, and he wants to take the Earth back for humanity. And, I mean, as far as an, as an introductory section of the book goes, this is fine. Um, but this whole segment where he gets captured up to the point where he starts learning the machine and wants vengeance is more than 30 pages. So, like, you could have made it go a little faster, guys. So, we go back to Turl talking with his boss some, and his boss mentions that everyone that works on the planet is getting their pay cut in half and they're losing their bonuses because apparently the mining operation on Earth just isn't very profitable. And so they're like, well, we're gonna have to cut some fat somewhere. And it's not because, like, the Earth is running out of metals or anything. They still have plenty of that. It's just, for whatever reason, <laughs> they can't, uh, they can't make much money off of it. And Turl tells his boss, like, well, we could cut costs easily by using humans as a workforce. And his boss is like, no, I'm not doing that. And Turl just thinks, man, I need leverage on him to get him to do what I want. Leverage, leverage, leverage. And, like, every other paragraph he says, leverage, I need leverage, leverage, I need leverage. And it's really hard to get across just how often he uses this over the course of the next couple hundred pages. Like, I need leverage on this guy. I need leverage on this guy. Leverage, leverage, leverage. Like, I understand um, using repetition in order to get across, like, how a character thinks or in order to put emphasis on something because, you know, using it over and over again, you think, yeah, it's important. But it gets really obnoxious and annoying after a little while, and I, frankly, it's just stupid. I hate that I have to keep defaulting to that, but, like, sometimes stuff can't really be explained beyond it's kind of stupid and annoying. So Turl takes Johnny out with a truck so that he can teach him how to drive it. Uh, okay, I'm sure that'll be great for when he needs to know how to mine, but whatever, whatever. Um, and he has to go to Zit again in order to get it. And he asks Zit for the truck, and Zit just says, no, we're not doing that. And then they have a fight where Turl slaps him around a bit and Zit finally agrees, fine, fine, you can go. And, see, this is, there's a weird dichotomy here. Because at this point, and at a couple other points, we see that the Cyclos will, you know, steal, cheat, lie, and murder each other in order to get ahead. And they certainly will steal, cheat, lie, and murder other races. But at the same time, they seem to be this bureaucratic war machine with volumes upon volumes of rules and regulations that they have to follow, and if anyone breaks them even once, then they're dead. And in fact, other races also seem to go uh, by that bureaucratic model. And so, it is just odd to see these two exist side by side. And if you wanted to go with a, oh, well, they pretend to be bureaucratic, but really it's just an excuse for them to go out and conquer and do whatever they want, then maybe you could do something with that, but they don't really focus on it enough for it to 
send any sort of message. It just feels odd. So Turl shows Johnny how to drive the truck a little bit, and he tries to have him give a demonstration for the other Cyclos, but then something goes wrong, and the truck blows up, Johnny almost dies, and it turns out that Zit sabotaged it. So Turl decides, okay, I need leverage on him. Leverage, 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 over and over and over again. And the short uh, version of this is that Turl steals some stuff, and plants it on Zut so it looks like he's the one that did it. And he then he catches him with other witnesses and stuff. He's like, hi, you, sol you stole it. And this is, uh, the, pe the penalty for this is death. So he gets uh, Zut to sign off on all the requisitions he wants for forever, and he knows that if Zut doesn't do it, he can just say the word and he'll be killed. So this moment is actually fine, or not even moment, it's like a whole couple of scenes which are taken up by this, um, but I think it's all right. It does make Turtle seem smart. It makes him seem like, yeah, he knows how to manipulate people, he knows how to plan, he knows how to play to his own strengths. Yeah, okay, I can I can see how this would work. So a little while later, Turtle and Johnny are driving around and they come across the ruins of the United States Air Force Academy, and Turtle apparently believes that it was the primary defense base for the entire planet because during the initial cyclo invasion, that was the last place uh, to stop giving any sort of organized resistance. Like, a single cyclo tank came upon it, and some of the cadets that were there were able to fight it off for about three hours before they were finally killed. And then Turl is like, Mwahaha, see? You, e even your primary defense base couldn't, c couldn't stop us. Mwahaha, I'm, I'm evil. And, like I said before, it's just, checking a landmark off the box to try and make you feel like, oh yes, this this is definitely in Colorado, but we don't get any real description of like the landscape or anything like that. And basically, Johnny uh, thinks about it for a little bit, and he's thinking, yes, those guys, even though their position was hopeless, they still decided to go out fighting rather than just let themselves be killed, and I think that's what humans should do. So, I guess it does solidify his uh, motivation, if nothing else. And then while they're driving, Turl also gives Johnny a bunch of exposition and trains him on weapons and tells him about how radiation blows up the cyclo breathe gas because, again, just give, give the hero everything you need, everything he needs to kill you. Because, uh, like, I was just praising Turl a second ago because it had a scene where he seemed intelligent and stuff, but now he just seems like an absolute dumbass because he's giving them away all the information that they need. So, uh, because all the Cyclo workers have had their pay cut, there's um, rumors of a mutiny, and so in order to prevent that, uh, Turl confiscates all the weapons and puts them under lock and key, because again, he's the security chief, he can do that. And, again, just... Foreshadowing. Big sign that says foreshadowing. You may as well put it out there. And he's still not allowed to use humans, though, because his boss doesn't think it's a good idea. He thinks they'll get in trouble. And then we bring in Kerr, that uh, midget cycle I mentioned not long ago, who trains him, uh, who trains Johnny on some of the machinery, and Johnny just asks him, hey, is this the only location, mining location that you have? And he's like, no, there's plenty all over the world, see? And he, like, shows him a map, just Again, all of these villains are just way too friendly considering that they're supposed to be villains. Like, way too friendly and helpful. So Johnny attempts to escape, and while he does that, he runs into Chrissy and some of the others who came out to look for him, and then Turl captures all of them, and he holds Chrissy hostage as a way to say, hey, don't you act up, boy. I'll, I'll kill her. Don't think I won't. And then... Okay, fine. And then Turl uh, discovers what might be the dumbest part of this whole book. So he discovers that his boss, named Noof, is... He's skimming money off the top from the company. Like, that whole uh, half payroll cut that he mentioned, uh, yeah, the, the head office did not order that. Uh, really, it's just Noof and his nephew, who works back on Cyclo, uh, are telling the workers that they're only getting paid half, but then they're taking the rest and keeping it for themselves. Now... In addition to Turl just discovering this, you know, it doesn't take him long to do it. He just sort of comes across it and he's like, oh, now I have my blackmail. In addition to that, 
a company could not function if it could not keep track of its money like that. Because it's, it's mentioned that it's over 100 million credits a year, and the average worker gets paid like 50,000 credits. And uh, even the head boss only makes like 75,000 credits every year. So 100 million credits is a lot, a lot of money. And anyone who's ever worked in any sort of accounting or finance will tell you that every cent has to be accounted for in order to prevent shit like this. And the people who try the things like this are usually not stupid enough to steal so much money that it would immediately get noticed like that. Because that much money would get noticed. And they apparently did such a bad job of uh, covering their tracks that Turl could find it just by looking at the books for a couple of minutes. Like, he's not even an accountant or anything. He's just able to look at it and go, oh, all this money is missing. Turns out he's stealing it. And just no company that was that bad at keeping track of its money would be able to function for any length of time. And it's mentioned that the Intergalactic Mining Company has been around for many thousands of years. So th that just... That would not happen. They could not do that. Even if it was uh, a relatively small amount of money, which this is not, they would notice and they would kill whoever did it. And it's mentioned that this went on for like 20 years before Turl got wind of it. It's just... Like, look, normally this wouldn't bother me that much, but when you consider that the second half of this book talks a lot about banking and finance, you, I would have expected Hubbard to know much better than this. So Turl, after apparently not even being smart, he just gets lucky a couple of times, uh, he blackmails his boss and tells him, hey, whenever I bring you something up here to sign, you're going to sign off on it. And he's like, okay, fine. And he's, he, he's just agreeing, okay, fine, you can let the humans do some mining up in the mountains where we can't. Um, so then Turl takes Johnny to Scotland, and where there's still some humans up there, because it's mentioned that uh, North America got hit the hardest, and so there's very few humans here. Like they mentioned, there's 30-something in Johnny's tribe, and then there's a couple people in British Columbia, and that's pretty much it throughout the whole, uh, the whole book. But over in Scotland, there's still like hundreds, if not thousands, of people running around. So Johnny goes up to them, and he basically gives them the whole story up to this point. He's like, yo, a demon demon known as a cyclo has kidnapped me uh i have a plan to take back the earth if you guys want to work with me then we're just gonna have to pretend to be slaves and we're gonna go do it what do you say and apparently he's just um he's just that cool because we don't actually see most of the conversations that he has with people in order to recruit them we he it just says johnny gave a speech and then they, they go with him. They're like, yes, we will follow you because Johnny is just that cool and just that awesome. His Mary Sue-ness bends the whole universe around him. But, you know, it's... <sighs> Actually, no, no. I'm not going to say, like, whatever or cool or anything like that because this bit is just dumb and it takes away what could have been a decent character moment. But, you know, Tur uh, Johnny takes back a couple a dozen Scotsmen with him and Turl believes that they're all slaves and they start to learn Cyclo and how to work machines and all that other stuff that Johnny learned, but Turl still doesn't speak English, so he's at kind of a disadvantage in terms of communication there. Okay, and as I said, there is a lot of stuff that happens all at once here, so I'm going to do my best to condense it. Uh, basically, the Scots and Johnny set up a mine in the Rocky Mountains, and they you know start mining the gold, and Turl is keeping an eye on them, but when I say keeping an eye on them, he what it really means is uh, two or three times a day, a recon drone will fly overhead and take a still photo. So, surely there's nothing they could get up to in that time. And uh, Turl also let them have, like, transport planes and stuff so they can fly around on their own without his supervision. Again, dumbass. Um, and they managed to take NORAD, which, again, just checking off boxes. But, you know, this bit I actually kind of like because, you know, they go into NORAD and it which, if you're unfamiliar, that's also in Colorado. It's like 40 minutes away from where I live. It's it's an entire military installation that was built on the inside of a mountain. It's supposed to be like where the government goes after in the event of a nuclear war. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, and they go there and they find the record of the invasion, which apparently what happened was the Cyclos teleported a big uh, drone to the Earth, which then started pumping out poison gas at uh, population centers, and the humans tried taking it out with missiles and stuff, it didn't work, 
And then uh, when the drone was done, they sent the Cyclos sent in tanks and planes and infantry and stuff to mop up the survivors. And I did like this bit because it feels like y you can sort of feel the desperation and the hopelessness that the humans did at that time. And Johnny basically says, hey, we'll, we, we get it. You guys fought and you lost, but because you fought, we we're able to finish things off now. Again, it, it kind of cheesy, but I did like that bit. It, you know, it, it does really feel like, yeah, this is humanity's last hurrah, and if they fuck up, then we're all, we're all dead. And around this time, it becomes clear that uh, Johnny's plan is to teleport some sort of bomb back to Cyclo. And because, again, he knows that the breathe gas will go off if there's any sort of radiation, so they start searching for uranium or any sort of other things that'll give off radiation that they can teleport back there. Because the uh, mining company actually has a semi-annual firing, is what they call it, where they just take all the workers and stuff who are going on leave and all the materials and everything, put it on a big platform and fire it back to Cyclo, and also some other stuff will come from Cyclo to there. And basically every colony does that. And so their plan is, in addition to killing all the Cyclos on Earth, to just do that in order to prevent a counterattack. Again, smart enough plan. However, in their search for uranium, they have difficulty because they don't have any Geiger counters and they can't find any. Uh, but after a little while of searching, Johnny has an epiphany that, hey, maybe we can just use breathe gas. You know, it's not great, but if we could just get little small amounts and throw it near somewhere, we go, oh, radiation, and then they know it's uranium. And it wouldn't be perfect, but it would work. And I'm like, sure, that's fine. But the problem is that they don't have any breathe gas, so then they have to go out and do that. And at this point, it's just a yes but story. And what I mean by that is, actually a lot of thrillers have this problem, is like, okay, they're, the heroes come up against an obstacle, uh, they come up with a solution. Does the solution work? Yes, but they have to get something else to get the solution. It's like uh, the 2018 God of War game had a problem with this. It's like, okay, you come upon an obstacle, and in order to get through that obstacle, you have to get this item. But in order to get that item, you have to go through this whole long journey. And then once you get that item, you bring it up to the obstacle, you go through the obstacle. Oh shit, there's another obstacle, so you have to go and do something else. And that's basically how this whole book is structured from this point forward. And it does get extremely repetitive, especially considering the length. Like, if this book was half the length, I would not have nearly as much issue with it as I do. But... At a thousand pages, you gotta keep my attention. So Johnny leads a small raid on a Cyclo outpost to steal some breathe gas that they can use as makeshift Geiger counters. And while he's there, he takes out some Cyclos with melee attacks. Like he literally takes a rifle butt and hits them and takes them out like that. And I'm just thinking, guys, Cyclos weigh like five times more than you. Like these are massive beasts. I don't think you could take them out that easy just by hitting them. Like. Shooting them I'd understand, but it's just inconsistent. And again, this book has several issues with that, but it's just trying to show off how cool the main character is by having him essentially punch a horse to death. That, that's essentially what happens there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, during the raid, he sees Chrissy in her cage, and she seems like she's starving and everything. So... Later, he manages to get a message to Turl, and while he's talking to him, he says, hey, I need you to give Chrissy food and stuff. But, because he doesn't want Turl to know that he was at the raid at the outpost, he tells him that humans have mind powers, so he's able to communicate with her that way. And Turl just believes him? Like, like he, he just goes with it. He doesn't do any follow-up research or anything. He's just like, yeah, okay, humans have mind powers. I'll, I'll treat your girlfriend nicer. Turl is seriously the dumbest fucking villain of all time. So Turl knows that if he mines the gold on the company planet, then the gold belongs to the company. But he wants to keep it all for himself, so what he's going to do is he's going to have the humans deliver it to him, he's going to smuggle it onto Cyclo, uh, in coffins actually, and then he'll just dig it up and sell it bit by bit and he'll be himself, uh, or he'll be rich and have all his fame and everyone will love him, yada yada. Um, but in order to prevent any witnesses from telling anybody about it, he... So he finds the old gas drone that the Cyclos used during their initial conquest and sets it so that the day after he gets all the gold delivered, it'll just fly around and kill off all the remaining humans. 
and um okay sure i i got no issue with this bit it's just taking more and more time to do stuff in a story that's already extremely long so johnny goes back to his old village and he tells them all about the shenanigans he's been getting up to in the past like a uh, year and a half at this point yeah at this point it's been like a year and a half since he left so this whole story takes place over the course of like three years which is kind of odd because i never really felt like that much time was passing but that's a nitpick it's really not that big a deal but basically he goes to his village and he tries to get them to leave because it turns out radiation is in the area that's what's making everybody sick and you might be wondering well how did johnny avoid it if he's also living there listen up a sudden chill came over johnny and not from the morning cold that flash was right alongside the path where the villagers went two and three times a day for water and more as a little boy, he had been a mutineer on a subject of what work he would do. He was a man, he had said, illogically, since he had begun this soon after he could walk, and he would hunt, but he would not sweep floors or bring water, and he had never fetched water from that spring. So, Johnny avoided the radiation because he basically said he didn't want to do any work. Makes him seem like kind of a dick rather than a hero, doesn't it? So while this is going on, Turl finds out that there's a federal investigator somewhere uh, in the mine, and he thinks, oh shit, this guy's coming after me. And so we have this whole long rigmarole where he's like really paranoid, and he goes after this guy, and then eventually he just kills him. And then he realizes, well, I'm probably screwed, so I'm just going to have to take all the gold and stuff I can get and get the hell off the planet and go into hiding somewhere as soon as I can. But then he realizes after he killed him, oh okay, he actually wasn't after me. Cool, I'm in the clear. So, that whole that whole story arc is just a cul-de-sac, which is why I'm basically skipping over it now. It's like, it's just the villain getting lucky, and then it seems like he's actually really smart. Ho ho. So, the humans deliver their gold to Turl, and he hides it in the coffins, like I mentioned before. Uh, but they actually sneak in at one point and replace all the gold inside the coffins with bombs that they got from... Uh, NORAD and from other places. And as I said before, their plan is to teleport the bombs onto Cyclo, and then as soon as the radiation hits the atmosphere, it'll go boom, and they're hoping it'll destroy the uh, teleportation platform, or possibly even an entire city, and that would prevent an immediate counterattack. So it would give them some time to, you know, build the Earth back up and properly protect itself. Really not a bad plan. And in fact, this is the climax of the first half. So, Right after this happens, uh, the humans gather up all their weapons and they launch an attack on the Cyclos, and because the Cyclo weapons are all under lock and key, they aren't able to fight back all that effectively. And meanwhile, the humans send out battle planes all over the planet and destroy most of the other installations. The only one that they capture wholesale is the Denver one. Uh, and we even get a uh, decent bit of action where Johnny and Turl are in a fight in the air in battle planes, and Turl gets shot down, and yeah, this is actually an okay climax. The issue comes when Turl uh, does his evil, maniacal villain laugh and tells Johnny, Ha ha, I sent the gas drone off already. There's no way you'll be able to stop it before it kills everybody. Ha ha. And then Johnny has to go off and stop the gas drone. Now, that sounds fine on paper. The problem, or maybe it doesn't because this is paper, there's kind of a weird saying when you think about it, but whatever, you know, it's it's the same as like the villain saying, haha, the bomb's gonna go off soon and the heroes have to go off and try and defuse it. You know, it's it's the same principle. The, the thing is, like, you could just as easily have done that with, oh, the drone is about to launch, we have to stop it before it launches, because the moment, from the moment Johnny finds out about the drone to the moment he takes it off, to, or takes it out, is more than 70 pages long. Like, first he has to uh, get himself into a plane, then he has to fly the plane over there, and then he has to um, talk to the Cyclo who's flying the other plane, which is escorting it, and convince him to stop flying it. And then he has to land inside the drone and go in there. But it turns out Zit is in there, so he has to fight him, and then he has to plant all the charges, and oh my god, it just goes on and on and on. But uh, after all of this... They manage to teleport the bombs back, and they go off. Uh, they don't know exactly what happened over there. All they know is, like, it destroyed the platform. Uh, and they 
killed off most of the Cyclos, the few that are left they keep prisoner, including Turl, because Turl is the one who gave all the, hu the humans all this technology and everything that they needed to rebel, and so he, Johnny thinks that he can keep Turl as a bargaining chip in case other Cyclos come back, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. So that's the end of the first half, and that's also where the movie ends. So, in the second half, Johnny goes from being this perfect manly man character who is the savior of mankind to this perfect godly character who becomes ruler of the universe. And the, the second half is act, it's actually a little bit more than half, I'd say it's closer to 60%, but the point is this bit is a lot less dense with information, so I should be able to get through it faster, but it's just... At first, it was che a cheesy story about a manly man doing manly things, but after this point, it it's very clearly just a self-insert Gary Stu, and I cannot stand it. So, during the explosion after he took out the gas drone, Johnny got some brain damage. And at first, I was actually pretty surprised by that. I was like, wow, the, the hero actually got hurt, and he's actually going through physical therapy and stuff, and he's trying to regain the use of his hands and leg, hands and feet, and I'm just thinking, wow, like, it, it's not often that fiction of any sort, whether it's movies or books or anything, really acknowledges how getting injured can have lasting effects that never fully heal. Um, but of course, Johnny does eventually get back his, uh, get back the use of his whole body, and that might sound fine if he had to go through physical therapy and such for it, but that's not how it happens, really. Really, he just is better one day, and Johnny got better because he thought really hard about it. McKendrick said it was another part of his brain taking over the lost functions. Under stress, he had assumed, those lost functions and nerves healed because of a battle, but Johnny didn't believe that. Johnny's theory was that he manipulated the nerves, and it was working. He had begun by simply willing his arm and leg to do what he wanted. Each day he had gotten a bit better, and now he could trot, no cane, and he could throw. So I guess Johnny just has super psychic healing powers now. Alright. So a big part of the second half of this book is the humans trying to set up a sort of world federation. So they go around and find all the other tribes that are scattered around. You know, they find some uh, Germans hanging around, they find some people in South America, some people in Africa, some Chinese people, um, and for the most part that's fine. The government structure is also a little weird, but again, that's fine. Uh, the only tribe that I thought was kind of odd was they find one that was apparently descended from a Red Army unit that was in Afghanistan. And I got that, and I had to stop and think for a moment, I was like, well, the Soviet Union, and therefore the Red Army, weren't around anymore by the year 2000, and they certainly weren't in Afghanistan anymore, how how would they still be around? And then it clicked for me, oh okay, Hubbard wrote this in 1980, the Soviet Union was still around, and he probably didn't imagine that it would have collapsed in the 90s the way it did in real life, so he just wrote it that way. And th then once I realized that, I was like, okay, so it's not really Hubbard's fault that this bit of world building doesn't make sense, but nonetheless, it it, it did take me out of it. As for the government that they set up, it's, like, fine in some ways. Like I said, it's kind of weird, but, eh, okay, when you consider that it's a bunch of tribal people who really want to maintain their own autonomy and don't feel that much camaraderie with other members of their human race that are scattered all throughout the world, that's, that's fine. The issue is that democracy really only works if it's properly respected, and... These people at this point basically worship Johnny almost as a god, and I feel like they should just do anything he says, but at the same time we have, uh, quote, unscrupulous types who just sort of push him away from the levers of power and try to take control for themselves. But at the same time, I just don't know how that would work when the average people look at Johnny like this. The size of the throng was growing. The bulk of the trainees at the academy, when they heard Johnny had appeared at the count compound, demanded a few hours off instantly, and the schoolmaster, understanding but unable to do anything about it anyway, had let them off, and here they were in a swarm. More people were in from New Denver. All work had stopped, and machines were now deserted in the underground shops at the compound. Several council members appeared on the outskirts of the crowd. Like, e even the important people think Johnny is just the coolest thing ever, so it does, it does feel odd to me, but... Okay, sure. 
wh whatever, we will stick with it, especially because, as I said, democracy only works when people really respect it, and, like, and that goes for any type of democracy, whether you're talking pure uh, direct democracy, like uh, old school, or ancient Athens, excuse me, uh, or more modern representative democracies where you vote for your uh, representatives and they vote for you, like, that that really only works if people respect that, yeah, okay, I, I lost this vote, but it was a fair election, and that's fine. Like, if people stop doing that, then the whole system falls apart. And you can look throughout the 20th century for uh, countries that fell to fascism and such, and you can see it, it's basically the same thing that happens over and over again. And we, we do kind of see that in this. Like, there's a person from Johnny's Village named Brown Limper who really hates Johnny and wants to take power, and we, we see him kind of try to manipulate the system, he's just not very good at it, and it just... I don't know, it feels like a different story all of a sudden. So Johnny, knowing that the Earth is mostly defenseless at this point, uh, wants to master cyclomathematics because the uh, machines that he had teaching them just didn't have that uh, in them. And so he starts talking to some of the cyclos about it, but they all try to kill him as soon as he asks, and then they kill themselves. They, like, they just will not give over this information. And he's like, huh, okay, we need some more live cyclos then that we can uh, dissect them and look at their brains and see if there's anything that's causing this. And so they go to Africa, uh, which is where the last little outpost of cyclos is that they didn't manage to destroy. And uh, there's a group of humans that wanders that area called the Brigants, and they're led by a guy named General Snith. Okay. So they go there, they attack the cyclos, they kill... 100 of them in open battle without taking a single scratch, despite being at a disadvantage in terms of weaponry and training and all that, but okay, sure, we'll just, we'll, we'll just go with that. And then they bring them back and they start examining both the uh, live and dead cyclos to see if there's something wrong with their brains. Now, while all of this is going on, Turl is still held prisoner, and Brown Limper and another guy named Thor uh, start talking to him, because they, uh, Brown Limper thinks, okay, maybe this guy can help me take over the planet. And Turl feeds them the most obvious lies about how evil Johnny is and how nice the Cyclos are, and they just believe him. Oh, indeed, the Cyclos were very peace-loving people. Honest, kind, good to their friends, trustworthy. He himself made it a rule of his life never to betray a trust. What? Oh, yes, it was too bad this animal Tyler didn't have the principles and morals of a Cyclo. Yes, he agreed someone should have taught him to be honest and upright when he was young. Like, dudes, my, my guys, this, this guy, he has destroyed your planet. Th this race have destroyed your planet. They've destroyed your civilization. They've killed a bunch of your friends. You've seen them in person now. How do you believe this and why? All of the villains in this are just so dumb. And, and that doesn't make the heroes seem cooler. In fact, it makes the heroes seem more lame. Like, heroes are much cooler if they can defeat villains that are smart. I don't... I don't get it. Why? Why Why did you do this to me, Hubbard? Why did you make me see this stupidity over and over and over again? So while Turl and Brown Limper and the others are talking, uh, Turl says that he just wants to build another teleporter so that he can go home because he just wants off of the Earth. And in his mind, he's thinking, Haha, I'm gonna go there and then I'm gonna bring back an entire army and kill all of you! Uh, and Brown Limper agrees to it, uh, but he wants something in return. So Turl tells him, okay, the Earth is property of the Intergalactic Mining Company, so I'll just sign over the entire planet to you if you bring me the materials I need. And then he does it. You know, he doesn't expect anything to come of it because he doesn't think he has the actual authority to do that, but he signs over uh, the the planet, and it's all notarized, and it's, it's a perfectly legal contract, and then he gets to work building the teleporter. So Johnny spends some time to set up the Earth Bank. Again, a lot of talk about finance for really no reason. Uh, and then they finally manage to cut open the Cyclo's head, and they find this little implant in there. And it takes like 20 pages for them to really get to the point of it. But basically, the implant is set there so that anyone who asks about Cyclo mathematics, the Cyclo is filled with an overwhelming urge to kill them. And if they can't do that, then they kill themselves. And that's how they prevent their the secrets of their teleportation technology from getting out. That's, um... That's kind of dumb to begin with, but then it also turns out that 
the implants are what cause Cyclos to be so uh, murder-happy and to enjoy inflicting pain on others. I, I really don't know what to make of that. Uh, yep, yep, we're just gonna move on from that. But it is an important plot point. You know, Johnny finds out, oh, okay, yeah, I can't just convince them. I, I have to find another way. I have to figure it out on my own. So, again, to make things short, uh, the Brigants and Brown Limper stage a sort of soft coup where they take over the Denver area and most of the other people who are loyal to Johnny flee, and Turtle is able to build a teleporter, uh, but then Johnny and some of his other loyalists uh, come back and they manage to kill Brown Limper and the Brigants uh, just as Turtle is firing off the teleporter and... He basically says, Mwahaha, I will defeat you forever, Tyler. And then he pushes a button and is teleported away and he's gone. And I just want to point out that there are more than 300 pages left in the book at this point, And we never see Turl again. Never. Never. We'll come back to him, don't worry. But that's the last time we see the main villain of the series. Around this time, we also meet a new character who... When they first introduce him, he's giving no name and no description. He's just the small gray man. Uh, but later on, we learn that his name is Voraz. And given that uh, the second movie was never made, you know, they planned to make a second one, but they, the first one sucked ass and never made any money. But had they made a second one, I think that they would have wanted even more Scientology star power in it, because they already had John Travolta. So I figure... In my mind, Veraz is played by Tom Cruise. <laughs> Anyways, Veraz is in a ship orbiting around the Earth uh, along with a bunch of other aliens, and they're basically saying, hey, we think the Cyclos are gone. We want to take over the Earth, but we can't attack yet. It might not be safe ad infinitum. Like, there's just a bunch of chapters that follow them. Okay. And um, it's mentioned that most of the aliens that are here are part of a race called Tolneps. And the Tolneps were mentioned a couple of times. It's mentioned that uh, they actually have been at war with the Cyclos a lot. And the last war between the Tolneps and the Cyclos was actually inconclusive. So you see that and you're supposed to go, oh, these guys really are, they mean business. Uh, but then they attack the Earth and a bunch of them are killed and some of them are captured because... Despite being about as dense as iron and basically bulletproof, these guys have to wear these special uh, visors in order to see, and if you take it off of them, then they'll go blind and you can take them out easy. Okay, you know, giving your villain a kryptonite really only works if that kryptonite isn't super obvious and easy to get a hold of. So the Tolneps start bombing human cities, most of which are completely empty, but they, they don't know that because... I, I don't know, I feel like... Even back in the 80s, they would have thought that aliens who can orbit a planet and go across galaxies and such would have strong enough telescopes to just look down and see, hey, there's nobody there, or x-ray vision or something. Uh, but then we also get this weird rant on religion, which I'm pretty sure was just L. Ron Hubbard complaining about the FBI investigating Scientology. He explained that it must be the pagoda. The reason was that he hated all religions. Religious people were zealots and upset governments and always had to be crushed. Hubbard, my dude, you committed a lot of crime. That's what happens. Uh, other than that, though, this bit is pretty good. In fact, I have a stretch of, like, over 20 pages where I didn't take any notes. Like, the Tolmeps are attacking the humans. The humans uh, plant a bunch of mines around the city of Edinburgh in Scotland and manage to take a bunch of them by surprise. They kill a bunch of them. They capture a bunch more. Like, they... Okay, they manage to bring things to a stalemate, and then they bring it into peace talks. And the peace talks... Look, I'm open to the idea that the real battle would be after the fighting has stopped, and it's really just a mind game at that point. Like, how can you utilize the leverage that you have? How can you get more leverage without killing people? Because um, neither side really wants to do that anymore. Like, I, I think that's an interesting idea, if nothing else, for a climax, because it's different than what we usually see. But my god, this goes on forever. Like, we, we have more than a hundred pages, essentially, of preparing for peace talks, and then doing the peace talks, and then finalizing the peace talks, and it's just... It's just there to make Johnny seem 
super smart and diplomatic as well as being a badass warrior. So I'm gonna try and do this as quick as I can. Uh, first, Johnny determines that the Tolneps were not actually acting on orders of the Tolnep government, therefore they're basically just pirates, and he actually goes through like a dictionary and looks at the definition of pirate to make sure they're all on the same page and they all agree to it and it, yada yada yada. Okay. Second, uh, the Tolnep leader Schleim, or, or Schleim, Schleim, something like that, uh, plans to kill everybody there. Like, he actually has hidden weapons with him, and he's like, I'm just gonna kill everybody here, my men are gonna come in, kill everybody, and then we're gonna take over the planet. Mwahaha, because every villain in this is just evil for the sake of being evil. Uh, third, we have Johnny show off, because he still has the teleporter that Turl built. So we have Johnny show off by teleporting a special cyclo bomb to the Tolnep moon, where most of their uh, spaceship fleet is, and then setting it off and destroying the hangar, and destroying a bunch of their ships, probably killing a bunch of their people. Which feels like an act of war to me, which maybe you shouldn't do that while you're in the middle of peace talks, while you're trying to prevent people from attacking you anymore because you're very vulnerable, but... Okay, sure. Uh, and then... And then this happens. Schleim screamed, then he acted. He popped his earplugs shut, then leapt up. He wrenched at the bottom ring of the scepter and, as though it were a machine gun, swept it in an arc from left to right to freeze them all. Paralyze! screamed Schleem. Stand dead, damn you! Stand dead! So, not only did he attempt to fight all of them the way that he said he wouldn't when he, you know, agreed to peace talks, but he just admits to it right in the middle of everything. He's like, why isn't my evil plan working? Like. Why would you say that out loud? I don't I don't understand. Like, maybe you could talk your way out of it if you just stood up and pointed at them, but... Just every villain. Every villain is so irredeemably dumb. And so, because uh, all this happened, and because, you know, the Tolneps don't have rightful ownership of the Earth, and because uh, uh, the General Schleem tried to attack everybody, the Tolneps are fined one trillion credits, which is going to get divided amongst everybody, and then hostilities end. And that's not the end of the book, but that is the end of that segment. So then we get to what might be the dumbest part of this entire book. Basically, Johnny teleports a camera to uh, a spot several many light years away from Cyclo so that he can see uh, what happened the day he sent the bombs back. And what happened was, again, he was just planning on destroying the teleportation platform and maybe the city around it, but what happened was that Cyclo has been so thoroughly mined out that the entire crust is full of tunnels and stuff, and so when the bombs went there, it destroyed the crust and then sent more bombs to the core of the planet, and when they went off, it started a fusion, nuclear fusion reaction, which then turned the entire planet into a star. One, that's not how stars work. Like, you need a lot more mass than a single planet. Like, even if Cyclo is a lot bigger than Earth, which is mentioned, you, you'd need a lot more than that. But, in addition to that, all the Cyclos on all the colonies, because their uh, teleportation to and from the home planet is uh, scheduled so exactly, they all just teleported themselves into the middle of this new sun, which wasn't supposed to be there. So, all of the Cyclos are now dead, except for the couple that are on Earth. Including Turl, by the way. The main villain of the entire book just fucking yeeted himself into a star. Then whose fault is it? Mine. So, in addition to Johnny being some dumbass who just saved the day by accident, like, you can have accidents happen in the hero's plan, but the accidents have to get them in more trouble, not less. Like, that's just extremely unsatisfying. So, in addition to that, we have Turl's final dumb, stupid, pathetic act as a villain, which just makes him genuinely the worst villain I've read in a long, long, long time. Which is a shame, because at first he started off as kind of intimidating. You know, you really knew that this guy was somewhat intelligent, and he had all of this power that he could bring to bear against the humans, and it all of that just got pissed away almost immediately before it finally concludes with this shit. I I cannot describe how hard I facepalmed when I read that, but... And even setting that aside, Johnny did kind of commit a genocide, and he doesn't 
ever really even think about that. He doesn't even go, he doesn't feel guilt, he doesn't feel satisfaction, he just goes, oh, they're all dead, okay. So Johnny has a really long conversation with Voraz, you know, the Tom Cruise small gray man, and uh, his friend named Dries, who, I guess if we want more Scientology star power, he'd be played by Jason Lee. I know Jason Lee isn't a Scientologist anymore, but he was back then, so, you know, we'll leave that alone. But, anyways, basically, these guys are members of the board of the Galactic Bank, or the Intergalactic Bank, and they are there to, because all the Cyclos are dead now, they've, you know, defaulted on their debts and all of their property is up for grabs. So, <clears throat> the Intergalactic Mining Company, which was owned by the Cyclos, uh... That is the company that officially owned Earth, but because that's not around anymore, the uh, bankers are going to Johnny and saying, Hey, you guys owe us money, which is uh, 60 trillion credits, by the way, and if you don't give it to us, then we're going to have to repossess your property, which means they're going to take the whole planet and sell it off at auction, and whoever owns it will then be able to do whatever they want with the humans there. Now, that's obviously way too much money for the humans to pay. Like, even with all the gold and stuff that they mined, they only have a couple of billion credits, and they know this. So they're like, hey, Johnny, uh, why don't we just offer you and some of your friends a job? Because, you know, you, you know how to use the teleporter, and maybe you can eventually build some more, because only the Cyclos have them. Other races don't have them, and having access to one would be super useful. Uh, but Johnny just says no, because, you know, he's not the kind of person that would abandon his friends like that. And then he decides that he wants to end war altogether. Like, he just says, war is evil and I'm going to end it once and for all. Uh, sure. That's kind of coming out of nowhere. You know, up until this point, Johnny has been really focused on just protecting the Earth and making sure humans have control of it again, but... Alright, sure, we'll go with he wants to end war now. And then we finally reach the real climax of the story. So basically this guy named Baron Von Ruth comes out of nowhere to save the day. And Baron Von Ruth uh, is, you know, a tribesman from uh, Germany or Switzerland. And his family, before the Cyclos came, had worked in finance for generations. And so he apparently still learned all of that. Now, I'm calling bullshit because even if he could uh, read old history books and everything, some of that knowledge would just be lost, because not everything gets written down. Okay, sure, we'll say he knows all of this. And basically, we get this long-winded financial explanation, which is not too difficult to follow, but at the same time, I have a degree in finance, so that might be why. So basically, I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible here. So basically, when Turl signed over the Earth to Brown Limper, he was the highest ranking member of the intergalactic mining company that was left because all the others threw themselves into a sun. And when, when he signed that over and then he died, the Brown Limper also inherited all of the intergalactic mining company's assets, which means all the planets that they own, all of the uh, ores and metals that they've mined, all of the equipment that they use, like that, that's, that was all Brown Limpers. But then Brown Limper died, and so legally it would go to whoever the leader of Earth was. And now that's Johnny. Which means that Johnny owns uh, the entire intergalactic mining company, or what's left of it anyways, and he's just super wealthy. Like, this is all perfectly legal. Uh, now, in addition to all of this, when Cyclo collapsed, the economy went with it, because uh, they were no longer mining, so all of the metals that they mined suddenly shot up in price, and... Uh, they defaulted on all of their debts, so the intergalactic bank uh, was hemorrhaging money, and it was it's about to go under, essentially. And so that's why Voraz and Dries came over here in the first place, is so that they could take Earth and then hopefully sell it for enough capital to keep themselves afloat for a little while. And I, that, that's the gist of it. It goes on a lot longer, but that is all of the important details. Hopefully that's not too difficult to follow. Now, because Johnny has all of these assets, he tells the bank, okay, I am willing to bail you out if you will give us a two-thirds share in your bank. And they're like, what? That's a, that's a controlling share. And he's like, yeah, but, well, you can take it or leave it. And so they eventually agree, like, okay, fine, master of the universe, you're the most powerful guy ever. Uh, we will let you take control of our bank, and we'll let you have your planet. 
Now, here's, uh, here's, here's the thing. Johnny taking control of all this through some elaborate, complex strategy, that sounds pretty cool on its own. The issue is that this just comes out of nowhere. This is all information that the audience was not privy to up until this point, and the heroes didn't actually have to do anything except point out that information in order to get the villains to just do what they wanted. Like, the only bit about this that I kind of like is how it turns out that Turl signing over the planet was actually legal, because, you know, when that first happens, you think Turl's just messing with Brown Limper, but then it it comes back in a way, and you're like, oh, that's, that's a bit of a twist. I wasn't expecting that. So I liked that bit. But other than that, this is just an extreme deus ex machina. And that's also, th this is the climax of the book. Like, this is just the heroes getting out of trouble through the power of coincidences and not having to do anything. Like, this might be a little bit worse than the climax of Fallen, which I'm not going to go into that right now, but if you've seen my review, you know that essentially, literally God himself just comes down and saves the day, and it's the dumbest shit ever. And this might be a little bit worse, because saving the, the, saving the human race and saving the Earth has been the main goal of the characters throughout this entire story. God damn it. I, I'm not used to having hair this long. But it's been the main goal of the characters the entire story, and it just, yep, it, it's saved now. You don't have to do anything else. Like, my god. So Johnny brings together representatives from a bunch of other races, and he sets up some firing platforms with teleporters, because remember, he's the only one that has the teleporters at this point. And he sets them up with bombs, and he tells all of them, hey, if any of you try anything, we are going to teleport these bombs to your home planets and just fucking destroy all of them. And then one of them says, this is a declaration of war. Johnny stood there. Gradually, his presence brought silence. It is not a declaration of war, he said. It is a declaration of peace. No, no, that's, uh, that, that sounds like a declaration of war. But, it, you know, okay, whatever. And eventually, he just hides all the, te the teleportation platforms and says, Hey, if any of you try anything, all of these are going to go out and kill everybody. So just don't try anything. It's like mutually assured destruction, I guess, because, you know, they have fleets and stuff that could come in and destroy the Earth without much trouble. So, that, that, that's it. That's how he keeps the Earth safe. He tells them, hey, rather than your economies being used for war, you're going to use them for, to make consumer goods and stuff, which is a little weird that these economies could be that advanced and not know about consumer goods or not do anything with them, but... Alright, sure. We'll just go with that. This is the end of the book. I kind of wanted to get done with it now. So Johnny finds a really old Cyclo named Soth and manages to take out his implant and talks to him for a little bit. And Soth agrees to teach him mathematics. Uh, and it turns out that their rulers, the Cyclo like aristocracy, put in implants in order to specifically make them evil. But they had to put it on. Uh, they had to put it in every Cyclo to prevent it from ever being found out. In fact, Kerr is one of the only Cyclos that doesn't have one because he was just an extra pup that was born in his litter and he was literally like thrown out into the garbage, but he managed to survive somehow. And they are so strict about this that uh, Cyclos are only allowed to be born on the home planet of Cyclo. Like, any females that go off-world, they have to be sterilized. So the few remaining females that are on Earth are all sterile. Like, they'll never be able to make any more Cyclos, they're just, they're gonna go extinct. So, in addition to Johnny accidentally committing genocide, we now finally, finally have that little bit of Scientology dogma slipping in. Psychiatry is evil. You see, guys, those doctors who prescribe you medicine, medicine for your schizophrenia and your depression, or who go through therapy for you, they aren't trying to help you. They're actually part of the governments that are trying to turn you into evil drones. Listen to L. Ron Hubbard, listen to him and his cult. Jesus Christ, that was stupid. That was... I, I, I went this whole book being slightly impressed that he wasn't using it to push his beliefs, you know? I went through this whole thing thinking, you know, it, it feels like Hubbard, while he was a piece of shit, he was using this because he really just wanted to write a good story. And he might not have succeeded at that, I didn't think, but, you know, up until this point, I was thinking, yeah, he's not trying to push Scientology on us, but there it is.
Psychiatry is evil, guys. Wake up, sheeple. And then it's just the epilogue. Uh, it's years later, everything is great. Johnny and Chrissy have kids because, like, oh yeah, Chrissy is in this story. Um, and Johnny sort of goes away from society to be a hunter because despite having a net worth in many quadrillions of credits, he, he might have all this wealth, but he's too manly to actually use it. He only relies on himself because he's just that cool. You know, the wealth is just a status symbol. He doesn't want to actually use it to get soft or anything because manly man must do manly things. And everything is peaceful because we wiped out that one race of people who were causing all the trouble. Does anybody else see a problem with that? So overall, Battlefield Earth is pretty bad. Like, it's not as bad as the movie, admittedly, but the movie is bad in a funny way. The book is just bad. It's not even entertaining. <laughs> Uh, I thought it would be stupid action, for the most part, and while there is some of that, a lot of it is just planning and preparation. Now, don't get me wrong, having planning and preparation before you go into battle and actually do the action scenes is a good thing. Like, it makes them have more, a little more weight and the anticipation builds for it, but it just gets too repetitive when it's just characters searching for items and searching for information and then finding it, oh, but we need something else, oh, but we need something else. Like, it gets really, really repetitive. Uh, the characters in this book aren't even really characters at all. Johnny is just a perfect savior who never messes up, and when he does mess up, it winds up working out in his favor in the end anyways. And then at the end, he just sort of stumbles into being the most powerful person in the universe. I don't even understand how that would happen. Uh, Turl is the one who causes all the trouble, and he's the one that is the end of all the villains and the end of his entire race. Like, if Turl had not done anything, then the Cyclo Empire would have just kept on trucking for however many thousands of years until it eventually collapsed. Like, I'm certain it would have happened one way or another, because that's just the nature of things, but Turl brought it to an end within, like, a year, and all he wanted was just to mine some gold. So, okay, yeah, and all the other villains are kind of the same way. They're just dumb in order to make the hero seem smarter. Like, they have all this power, but they're idiots, so they never come across as intimidating or like they might actually kill people or anything like that. Uh, all the other good guys have maybe one trait apiece, and they all worship Johnny. Like, that, that, that's the thing, is Johnny's the only good guy character who has any personality at all, and even then, that's not very much. There are a bunch of others who are just kind of, yeah, we're, we're we're good guys, we work with him, we, we do everything he says, and occasionally we'll mess up, but then Johnny will come in and fix things, and so I, I genuinely have trouble even remembering the names of most of them. Uh, there are many small, dumb world-building moments, like how, for example, these Cyclos have not developed any new technology in over a hundred thousand years, it's mentioned at one point. Uh, it's mentioned that there are 16 universes. I, I don't know how that works exactly. Like, they mention hundreds of galaxies in 16 different universes. Uh, that's something that you need to go into a little more detail about if you're gonna bring it up. Uh, the bad accounting, which I mentioned earlier, and the fact that these supposedly brilliant bankers had to repossess Earth specifically. Like, they, they had all those planets that the Intergalactic Mining Company took over, but they, they went to this one specifically that already had a race of people on it that were defending it. Why not just go to one of the other ones way out in the middle of nowhere and auction that off? Like, wouldn't that make a little more sense? It's less trouble, but okay. And it's mentioned that the Tolneps are able to fight the Cyclos to a standstill despite only controlling one planet. Which is weird because the Cyclos control literally hundreds of thousands of them, so they should have way more resources and way, way, way more people than the Tolnips could ever bring up. And just, there's a lot of little moments like that which just took me out of the world and took me out of the setting. And as I said at the beginning, like, despite a huge chunk of this taking place in Colorado, there's no real identity to it. It could be anywhere else on Earth. It could be any generic mountains. Uh, it could be any generic cities. Just, there's not much here. 
Now, the first half of the story is kind of okay. You know, it does have some tension, it has a clear goal, and it's really not too long. Like, there are segments of it that go on longer than it needs to, but uh, it's like 480 pages before we get to the climax where, like, yep, we caught Turl and destroyed Cyclo and all that. But the second half, as I said, it has way too much math and finance in there. Like, I, I really mean it. I, I tried to skip over as much of it as I could, but there's a lot of talk of Johnny just, I want to find out about Cyclo mathematics, but I can't. And there's a lot of talk about setting up the Earth Bank and inflation and just... Like I said, I have a degree in this and it still bored me to tears. And then we get to... Uh, well, there's sort of two more climaxes. There's like one with the peace talks and one with uh, them just sort of having everything handed to them and Johnny is suddenly the owner of the Galactic Bank. And it's... It, it's very unsatisfying. But all in all, this, uh, this could be so much worse. It is mediocre, cheesy sci-fi that it's not really my cup of tea, but th there's other people that might enjoy it. Uh, really, I think this book would have faded away into obscurity if it weren't for the movie, and the movie would never have been made if it weren't for the fact that it was written by the guy who founded the Church of Scientology. Like, it's been reprinted a bunch of times just because they keep wanting to push it on people. Like, it's been reprinted 1982, 1984, 1995, and 1999 is this copy. I'm pretty sure they've done it more since then. But overall, it's... I can't say it's the worst thing I've ever read. Like, if I had to assign it a place in the order of the worst books I've ever read in this really long, in-depth format, I would say it's slightly worse than Fallen. Maybe it's about the same level as The Fifth Wave. Maybe slightly worse than The Fifth Wave, but overall, it's just not that noteworthy. And I think that about wraps it up. You know, I don't have that many more thoughts. It's just a book that's way too long for its own good. And next up, I'm probably going to go with the second place poll winner, but I might dip into that pile of angel young adult romances that I bought a while ago, because... That seems like it might be fun to do, but I'm not totally sure yet. We'll see. See you later. Special thanks to my patrons, Apo Savalainen, Ashley Watson, B. Quinn, Brother Santotis, Christopher Quinten, Embis, Emily Miller, Evan Stagall, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Madison Lewis Bennett, Mike, NB Star, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, and Vevictus, as well as all the other names here. You guys are the you guys are the best, let me tell you. And without you, I would not have been able to make this entire really long review of Battlefield Earth. I hope you enjoyed it. it I mean, if you watched this far, I assume you enjoyed it at least. Anyways, um, thanks for watching this far. Please like the video, comment on it, and subscribe if you haven't already. And check out my channel for more of these. Bye.